again until he came to do the show. But the next day they came to my home and visited for an hour or so, and that was very special. Hi, nice to meet you. All right. Come on. Okay, sure, you bet. To our humble abode. All right. My kids, they were excited to have him come visit, and he autographed a picture for the kids, which they enjoyed saying, my friend, Rick, to my friend. And that's very special to them. Rick Nelson gave the last concert of his life on the night of December 30th, 1985. Pat Upton captured this never-before-seen footage of the show on his home video camera. The people went nuts. They loved it, and as he was leaving, he turned around and waved, you know. And uh, oh, it was, it was the, the greatest thing, the biggest thing down. to happen to Gunners for Long About. The next morning, Rick and his band were scheduled to fly to Dallas for a sold-out New Year's show. When they arrived at the airstrip, they were disappointed to find that heavy fog had covered the area. In addition, the plane's engine was still being worked on. Finally, at 1 p.m., the DC-3 was ready. Thanks for the uh, pictures uh, to the kids. Hey. Appreciate it. Bye. Hey, see you next time. Bye-bye. He always had a fear of flying uh, ever since he was little. Rock and roll, yeah! As a matter of fact, I know he went to a hypnotist, and uh, they hypnotized you and give a post-hypnotic suggestion or something where you're supposed to be able to fly. And I think it worked a couple of times. And uh, But I, he flew so much later on in his life that I think he got used to flying. After they had the plane, uh, they made a final wave goodbye, you know. And uh, they were gone. My wife and I were standing in the kitchen, and I think she was on the phone, and we have a little television in the kitchen area, and a news broadcast came on, and I half heard it, and it said something about Rick Nelson, and I thought it was a promo for something or and I didn't really pay that, that much attention. Then they came on again, and I did hear this one, and said that Rick Nelson is reported to have gone down in the plane, and I was in complete shock. That I couldn't believe it. I just couldn't believe it. Aside from the obvious, <clears throat> when we return, we're going to reconstruct the events that led to a tragedy. Events that for the first time will show what really happened to an American hero. What happened? We'll be right back. Millions of his fans were stunned and saddened by his death. For them, the continuing rumors of freebasing only added insult to injury. In 1989, investigator Don Likens began to look into the events leading to the crash. When he examined the testimony of the flight crew, he became curious about an apparent malfunction of the plane's heater minutes before the DC-3 caught on fire. I can't give you a very precise time as to the first incident of, uh, of receiving an overheat light on the heater, but let's just say uh, 45 minutes into the flight, um, I got an overheat light on the on the panel in front of me indicating that the, that the main heater was overheating and I turned the heater off. I'm not very comfortable with that. Why don't you go ahead and take the airplane and I'll go back and take a peek at it. I got the aircraft. At that time, Mr. Rank indicated to me that he was going to go back into the tail section of the aircraft and take a look at the heater and see if he could see anything obvious, figure out why we were getting this overheat warning. I'm freezing. Huh? Are you cold? Yeah, it's not cold here. It's freezing. We need a little heat back here. Is it yeah. At some point, uh, Brad came forward and asked me what had happened when I turned the heater on again, and I said I didn't turn it on. Turned it back on. He said, "Well, Rick wants heat," and he reached to the panel where the switch was and turned it back on. Fifteen minutes after the heater was turned on, a serious problem developed. smell anything? 
smoking basis. Of our group came forward and tapped me on the shoulder and said, Ferg, we've got smoke back here. Hey, guys, hey, there's smoke in here. Listen to me, listen to me. This is fresh air vents. Try to stay calm. We'll take care of it, okay? Get up near the fresh air vents. That's not doing any good. Uh, one one Yankee to Texas Arcana. I'd like to turn this thing around. We've got a serious problem up here. One one Yankee, can you make it back to Texas Arcana? Uh, negative, negative. We've got to get this thing on the ground now. If you've ever seen an automobile burning on the freeway that's been hit and its fuel tank is ruptured and the car is burning, that's the kind of thick smoke that was filming the cabin of the air. situation that was without right answers there wasn't a correct thing to do that would have made it all all right they would have saved their lives or would have prevented what happened it would take until the next morning for the wreckage to cool enough to allow anyone inside the plane rick nelson's body was found in the rear it appeared he had tried to shield his fiance from the flames sadly this last heroic act would not be widely reported Several years passed. Fire engineer Norm Alvarez joined the investigation working with failure analysis and Don Likens in order to determine the real cause of the crash. I didn't consciously go in to prove or disprove anything. I consciously went in to attempt to find out as best possible uh, what caused the fire. In order to determine the real location of the fire, the men tried an experiment. We found a duplicate aircraft so that we could uh, get into our investigation into a real live aircraft with the equipment still on board. By igniting smoke bombs in a variety of locations inside the DC-3, they tried to duplicate the way that the smoke had spread. In test after test, the smoke was studied. The men hoped that the direction of this smoke would point to the real cause of the fire on board Rick Nelson's plane. Finally, after studying the data, Alvarez developed a theory about what had happened, a theory that centered upon the pilot's efforts to turn on the heater. Given that we had a, uh, a condition where the, the pilot was continually overriding the safety systems of the, the heater, uh, that's what I think started the fire. I believe that if this heater had not been mismanaged, if uh, the pilot had heated these warning systems that were built into it, that this accident wouldn't have happened. But Don Likens had some unanswered questions. One of the uh, mysteries of this thing that was never really resolved is as Rick Nelson's airplane was coming down in the last few seconds of its life, it was trailing uh, fire and it was also dropping particles in such quantities that it was setting fields on fire. What could have caused such intense heat? 
Likens believes that some burn marks found on the plane's tail could have been caused by a fire that began near the plane's wing, not inside the cabin. For this and other reasons, Likens believes that freebasing is simply out of the question. It's so ridiculous because at the time that the freebasing would have had to occur, the fire started, he had one of the survivors literally standing within feet of it. That's absurd. That the captain, who was in the back, verified in the back, standing in that area would not merely have put a fire extinguisher on it and put it out. Lycan soon found an explanation for what he believed had fueled the fire, and that answer was 40 years old. Most of the 35,000 DC-3s built in the 1940s were made out of aluminum. It's light, inexpensive, and durable. It also won't easily catch on fire. But during World War II, when Nelson's plane was built, there were shortages of aluminum. As a substitute, parts of some planes were built out of magnesium. It too is light, inexpensive, and durable, but it reacts very differently to fire. Don Likens believes that a fire could have started in one of the plane's engines and then, fueled by magnesium, quickly spread from the wing into the cabin. But no matter where the fire began, investigators are certain of one thing. The source of ignition was not where Rick Nelson was sitting. The aerosol cans found in the wreckage could have been used for any number of reasons, none having to do with freebasing. I am confident that he was not freebasing. I'm confident that this had nothing to do with the fire inside the cabin. I do feel very satisfied that we have uh, straightened out a wrong. And uh, he's a teenage idol, and he shouldn't carry that burden. Not an unfair burden, and that's an unfair burden. Lived the way uh, he wanted to and did the things that made him happy. I think if there's any message in that is that we should all, you know, give 100% and spend as much good time with the people that we love uh, while we can. The results of the work conducted by investigators Likens and Alvarez completely cleared Ricky and his flight crew of any wrongdoing. The freebase theory was totally dismissed, but it's been seven years since his death, and still the rumors continue. Now that we know what really happened, we can only hope that Rick Nelson will be fondly remembered as the son of Ozzy and Harriet, the brother of Dave, and one of America's favorite stars. Sometimes, finding out what happened involves actually reconstructing the accident based on eyewitness accounts and evidence at the scene. But what if there are no witnesses? And the only scrap of evidence is a single photo taken after the accident. Failure Analysis Associates recently used a scientific technique called photogrammetry to reconstruct the tragic events of an accident that left one young man paralyzed mm -hmm. and another grief-stricken. That's it. It was, it was a warm was talking about an aerosol in 1988. At, the end. at a New Mexico motorcycle park, a group of friends were enjoying their dirt bikes, ATVs, and the chance to be outdoors. A young man whom we will call Stephen Weston left for one final ride on his ATV 